Good evening, friends. We'd like to welcome all of you back to the New Heart Revival Series. I'd like to welcome those who are joining us across the country and around the world. If this is the first time that you are tuning in for this series, uh, this is night number three of a 10-part series. If you've missed any of the previous programs, they should be archived on the Amazing Facts website. You'll probably be able to find it on Amazing Facts uh, Facebook page as well. Now, if you're listening and you'd like to hear the program in Spanish, we are doing a live Spanish translation on the Amazing Facts Latino Facebook page. So you can go there right now, Amazing Facts Latino, for a Spanish translation of our revival series. Now, whenever you come to revival and you're spending time in God's Word, seeking Him, uh, confessing your sins, uh, drawing close to the Lord, asking for the Holy Spirit, it's important that we recognize that we can't do anything on our own. We need the Holy Spirit. The Bible says it's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. So before we even get into the study of God's Word tonight, uh, we need to seek the Lord in prayer. And so I want to invite you, wherever you might be, just join us as we ask God's special blessing upon our study today. Dear Father, we thank you that we have the opportunity to open up your Word and study together. Wherever we might be, divided up in different parts of the country and even around the world, Lord, we are grateful that we can come together. Your Spirit will be with us as we open up your Word and we seek for a deeper and fuller experience with you. We desire to be filled with the Holy Spirit and we long for that revival that only you can give us. So bless our time again this evening, for we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now for each of the programs, we do have a free offer that we would like to tell you about. It's free. All you'll need to do is just text uh, the word CONFESSION to the number 40544. And we have a book that we'll be sending you. It's got an intriguing title. It says, Is it easier to be saved or lost? So be sure to text again the word confession to the number 40544, and we'll send you a digital copy of the book, Is it easier to be saved than lost? And I think you'll find it a blessing as you read it and share it with somebody else. A matter of fact, if you know of somebody that would be blessed by spending some time together in God's Word this evening, this would be a good time to send them a text and give them a call and say, join us. And you can watch it on, of course, Facebook. We're on YouTube, on the Amazing Facts website, live stream, AFTV. So be sure to take a look at that and pass the Word around. Our goal is to gather together, seek the Lord in prayer and the study of His Word. Now, we do have questions that have come in. And we try to answer some of the questions from night to night. We want to thank all of those who are posting their questions. If you have a question related to revival or the Bible, you can go ahead and just type it there on Facebook where it says comments. And we'll try to answer as many of those questions as possible. So I'd like to invite Pastor Doug to come forward. And we're going to begin by taking a look at some of the questions that have come in. Well, good evening, Pastor Doug. Good evening. We're saying good evening to each other for their benefit. We've been here for a while. That's right. So <laughs> and for those watching, I know some of our friends are joining us from around the world. We have some amazing facts, uh, folks who are in India. And I don't know, is it early in the morning there or is it late at night? The Hoover family, early in the morning. So welcome. We're glad yeah. you're there. And also others. I know we have folks joining us in Australia and different parts of the world. We are glad you're part of this revival Amen. series. Well, we're going to get to our first question that we have today. It comes from Jackie. And the question is, is there ever a point where one can be transformed into a new character on earth like Elijah? Well, the Bible specifically addresses Elijah. If you look in the book of James, it tells us that Elijah was a man subject to the same passions as you and I, and yet uh, he overcame. Elijah got discouraged, and uh, he was human. And so when you read about the heroes in the Bible, like, like Daniel and Joseph and others and Job, uh, these were real flesh and blood people that dealt with all the same kind of temptations that we face. Jesus lived a godly life using the same power that is available to you and me. So can we have victorious lives? Absolutely. How much can we do with the Lord? I can do all things through Christ. And so, yes, you can have a new character. Absolutely. The Bible says old things are passed away. Behold, old things are new. And that's true for the Christian, of course. We do recognize sanctification is the work of a lifetime, and we shouldn't get discouraged, Pastor Doug, if mm -hmm. we stumble along the way. Let's just get up and pray and ask the Lord to give us more faith to trust Him, trust in Him even more mm -hmm. fully. Well, let's take a look at our next question. We have Sherry that's asking, what do you do when you are praying so hard to quit a habit but fail every day? Well, don't give up. If, now, I'm assuming you're talking about quitting a bad habit. <laughs> it's okay to have good habits. You know, one thing you can do... Uh, 
you know, let me just jump in real quick. Popped into my mind. I have a book. It's called Tips for Resisting Temptation. And so um, you'd really enjoy that. It's free. You can download it online at Amazing Facts. Tips for Resisting Temptation. And I give some of the high points of what you can do. But um, you overcome evil with good. Uh, sometimes we fall into the bad habits because we're in a routine. Find something good to replace that uh, role, that time with, or you know, it might be a food item. Find something good. I, when I quit smoking cigarettes, I actually got a box of toothpicks. Not the toothpicks are great, but I got a box of toothpicks. And whenever I would normally reach for a cigarette, I'd grab a toothpick instead. And, and uh, don't get discouraged. You may fall, as I mentioned before, a righteous man falls seven times, but they rise again. Every time you fail, get up, say, Lord, please help me. I'm not going to quit trusting in you. Give me the victory. And you can get the victory. Our next question that we have has come from Angela, and she says, what if we repented but still feel burdened? Well, you know, God wants us to have peace. Uh, Jesus said, in the world, you're going to have tribulation. Be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. Continue to pray. Yeah, sometimes I think the devil tries to just cast clouds of discouragement around us. Now, and I don't want to discount, you know, sometimes uh, people might physically not feel well. It could be their health. It could be depression. It could sometimes even be chemical medical things so that they've repented of their sins and they followed the Bible counsel uh, and they've confessed their sins. You need to believe and trust that God has forgiven your sins and uh, cleansed you from all unrighteousness. If you're still not feeling well, don't put all of your confidence in feelings. Put it in the promises of God. You know, I'm reminded of the verse, Pastor Doug, where the Bible tells us that we as Christians must walk by faith, not by sight. Mm -hmm. And what that means is our Christian experience isn't just based upon how we might feel. Sometimes as a Christian, we might sense the presence of God and we feel the love of God in our hearts. Other times we might not sense that, that presence, but it doesn't mean God mm -hmm. has forsaken us. Mm -hmm. We have many examples in the Bible of really godly individuals who went through times of testing and trial. I think of Job and mm -hmm. uh, Jacob and not others who really had to wrestle. Their faith had to wrestle with the promises of God and hold on to them. And so as Christians, we, we should hold on to the promises of God. Amen. Okay, our next, caller, our next question that we have is Emmanuel, and uh, he's got an interesting question. How many times is one allowed to be baptized? Is there a limit? It's almost like saying how many times you're allowed to get married. <laughs> uh, you would hope it's not many. Um, baptism is a serious occasion. You know, some people have been rebaptized. That's appropriate. And I've met a few people that were actually baptized three times. You know, I wouldn't put a number on it because the Bible doesn't put a number on it. But baptism is as important to the Christian as a wedding is to a marriage. And so uh, you know, there are couples that have renewed their vows. And sometimes a person, you know, after years of being a Christian, they feel like they've drifted and they want a new beginning. And they feel impressed by the Spirit to be rebaptized. I'd say talk to your pastor. Um, but, you know, if a person's getting baptized every couple of years, there's, there's something unhealthy about your patterns there. A baptism is supposed to be really a commitment that you make, you don't reverse. You know, Pastor Doug, we also have in the, f in the communion service uh, in our church, we mm -hmm. have something called the ordinance of humility or otherwise foot washing. And uh, you'll remember the story in the upper room where Jesus was washing the disciples' feet and he came to Peter and Peter said, Lord, you're not going to wa wash my feet. And Jesus said, if I don't wash your feet, you have no part with me. And then Peter said, well, then not just my feet, wash my hands and my head as well. That's right. Jesus said he who is bathed needs only to wash his feet. In other words, if we've committed our life to Jesus through baptism, we committed, there are times where we might stumble and fall and we need to have, if you like, a, a renewal, a recommitting. And I think that's what the foot washing yeah. also represents or symbolizes. It's that miniature baptism, a recommitting of our hearts and our lives to Jesus. Good point. And yeah. so another reason why someone might get baptized, perhaps uh, you've learned new Bible truth. Maybe you were baptized by immersion, but you came to a clear understanding of Bible truth. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean you deny that first baptism, but maybe you want to recommit to the Lord with a clear understanding of what the Bible is asking. Amen. And rebaptism is, of course, very appropriate in that situation. We have another question that's coming. We have Joel is asking, why isn't God performing open miracles in these days and how long will it be like this? Well, I believe God does still perform miracles. I think every conversion is a miracle. Uh, you may not be seeing someone go down the streets like Jesus or the apostles where the dead are being raised and, you know, uh, some of the more dramatic 
examples of healing and miracles, but I think you will see them. If you look in the Bible, you'll notice that miracles tend to come in waves before major events. The ten plagues came in Egypt before a major deliverance. I remember reading the book of Judges. Keep in mind, Gideon lived hundreds of years before Elijah, who did many miracles, and Jesus, who did many miracles. A Gideon asked the angel, whatever happened to all the miracles we used to see? And so it seemed like through God's leading of his people in history, the miracles come in waves. I think you're going to see another outpouring of the Spirit just before the second coming, and you will see signs and wonders and miracles again. Now be careful, don't put all your confidence in miracles because there can be true and there can also be false. The devil can counterfeit some miracles. We have a few folks who sent in some questions even now mm -hmm. while the program is being live. and So we're going to take one of those questions. Uh, we have Noel asking, uh, what does the Bible say about the days that we are living in right now, especially with this virus? Does the Bible have anything to say about what's happening today in our world? Well, I think it's interesting. You know, this whole revival kind of springs from a verse in the Bible that it says, if my people, and this is Second uh, Chronicles chapter 14, verse 7, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin and heal their land. Just before Solomon says that, he says, and if there is a, a pestilence in the land, that's a plague, a pandemic is just basically, pan means everywhere, epidemic means it's, it's global really now. And so I, I think it is a sign, Jesus says in Matthew 24, one of the signs is there'll be, Earthquakes, there'll be wars and rumors of wars, and there'll be pestilence or plague. And so, you know, these are things that we're going to see in the world, but what's happened is we've always had wars, but just the last century we had two world wars. Mm -hmm. There's always been plagues, but now we've got a global pandemic, and we had one, of course, in 1918. Historically, I think we're seeing that we're moving into the last chapters of prophecy. That's very unique, the situation that we find ourselves in today is, as you mentioned, Pastor Doug, to have this type of a pandemic literally affecting countries around the world, mm -hmm. shutting down the economies, not just of countries, but it <laughs> seems that the whole world, the economy is slowing down. So it's somewhat unique. It's yep. a special situation. We have another question that's come from Virginia, and she just sent it in. It's a good question. Maybe we'll end with this question. It says, how do I empty self? We've been talking about the need for emptying self so we can be filled with the Holy Spirit. But how does one do that? You know, that's the most important question probably that we could answer. And uh, the biggest battle Jesus faced was in the Garden of Gethsemane when he said, not my will, but thy will be done. And we face that ba battle every day. God is love. Uh, everything God does springs from love. The devil is selfishness. He is the ultimate opposite of that. We, through sin, uh, our, our love, our natural tendency to love was disrupted or distorted and, and w we become naturally selfish creatures. Uh, we need to pray for the new birth. The new birth is a new heart. God says, I will cause them to walk in my ways. And when we have the new heart, we find that God in the spirit, he gives us love for him and he gives us a love for our fellow man. And the more we look at the Lord and we follow his example, the more like him we become. And Jesus is the epitome of self selflessness. And so uh, you know, we humble ourselves before the Lord, believe his promise, pray for his spirit, uh, keep our eyes fixed on Jesus and through reading his word and beholding him through prayer we experience this transformation absolutely well again we want to thank all of you for sending in your questions keep doing so as we go through this week of revival and reformation uh, one of the things we want to do when it relates to revival is not only pray and read the word but mm -hmm. we want to sing songs of joy to the Lord, songs of praise. And we have a theme song that we've been singing through the series so far. It's called Spirit of the Living God. And right now, we want to encourage you, wherever you might be, join us as we sing our theme song. And Amanda will bring us a song at this time. Speak.
Welcome, friends, and this is a wonderful opportunity to come together with you for this New Heart Revival. And we've just been praying for the moving of God's Spirit with all that's happening in the world today, and you keep hearing uh, new phrases to try to explain it. A extraordinary, it's disruptive, it's momentous, it's historic, it's earth-shaking. Uh, we've never had a time like this in history before where there's been such a, a disruption going on in our society. And uh, we thought, you know, the f it looks like the final events are unfolding, and we need to be praying for the Holy Spirit right now. So we've been going through this series talking about how can we know that we're born again? How can we have the new heart? And uh, we talked a little bit about the thief on the cross. We talked about conversion. And tonight we're going to be talking about sincere confession. Now, in our meetings, we've been using the, the conversion experience of Isaiah as something as a springboard. You remember when Isaiah sees the Lord for the first time in Isaiah chapter 6, and through seeing God on his throne in his glory, uh, then he's transformed by that. Then he sees himself, and then he repents, he, and he confesses. He says, woe is me, I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips. And he's mentioning something specific here. And he says, and I dwell in the midst of a, pe a people of unclean lips. And so as a result of that, he ends up going through a dramatic conversion. God cleanses him, and then he sends them, him out. Tonight we're going to talk very specifically about uh, an important part of the Christian experience, the co conversion experience, that has to do with confession. Now I always like to use a story as a springboard, and I'm going to turn to one that I think you'll find familiar. It's in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15, verse 11. And Jesus said, There was a certain man that had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood, his inheritance. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, and he journeyed to a far country. And there he wasted his possessions with prodigal living, sinful living. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And he went and he joined himself to a citizen in that country, and he sent him out into his fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. Now, living a life of sin, this young man realized that he had squandered his opportunities, he had squandered his father's blessings, and every sinner ultimately will realize that before they repent, that God has given me so many opportunities and blessings and time and we waste it all selfishly. And then there's always a payday. Eventually, the, the pleasure is gone. A sin stops satisfying. It leaves you feeling empty. And he starts to think about when he was back in the Father's house. It says he came to himself. It's almost like it's describing sin as a form of insanity. And suddenly he got his sanity back. And he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare? My father's servants eat to the full. And I perish with hunger. Why did Jesus come? Whoever believes in him might not perish. This young man realized he's perishing. If you are not converted and saved, there's only one other option. You either have everlasting life through Jesus and the new heart, being born again, or perishing. And God does not want us to be lost. He wants to save us. He said, I'm perishing with hunger. You know what satisfies that hunger for bread? It's the word of God. I will arise and go to my father's house. Notice what's happening here. He's making a decision to go towards his father. Now the promise is in James, if we draw near to God, James chapter 4, or James chapter 2, verses 4 through 7, he will draw near to us. And so we want to be drawing near to God. He said, I will go to my father and I'll say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired servants. So he rose. He's got this speech of confession in his mouth. And he rose and he comes to his father. His father saw him a long way off. He had compassion and he ran and he fell on his neck and he kissed him. And the son said, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. As soon as he confesses, the father reacts by a completely embracing and adopting him back into the family. He says, you are my son. Calls for his servants. And he says, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand, meaning that he was now 
going to have the authority of the family and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let us eat and be merry for this my son was dead and he's alive again he was lost and he's found and they began to be merry. I'm not going to even go into the part about the other son because the point of the story I wanted to emphasize this young man came to himself he repented but then he realized I will say to my father there was something he needed to say uh, everybody is going to confess someday you can read where Paul says in the book of Romans chapter 14 verse 11 and 12 for it is written as I live says the Lord every knee will bow to me and every tongue will confess unfortunately according to the Bible most people are going to confess too late and so you see God sees everything we're doing and there's going to be a, uh, a reward for everything that's done now we all need to come to the Lord and confess our sins it's part of the salvation process you know, you can read in, uh, Luke, Jesus says in Luke chapter 12, verse 2, For there is nothing covered that will not be revealed, nor hidden that will not be known. Therefore, whatever has been spoken in the dark will be heard in the light. And whatever you have spoken in the ear in inner rooms will be proclaimed on the housetops. Now, don't be afraid of confessing to God, because God knows everything. You know, we're living in a, uh, an interesting time in the world's history where it seems like no matter where you go now, cameras are rolling. And, you know, I people can even go to websites where they can look through satellites and see what's happening on the Earth from space all over the world. Um, sometimes Karen will come in the office, she'll see that I'm on a program called Google Earth, and I'm looking all over the world to see if I can find deserted islands. Uh, I, I just love looking at maps. I'm just intrigued. I'm a very visual person. But everywhere you go now, everything, it seems like, is being recorded. And more than ever, you know, in the cities for security, <laughs> we just installed a video doorbell so that whenever anyone comes to our door, I know it's old technology for most people, but it was very interesting for me. Whenever anyone comes to our doorbell and they ring the door, we get an alert on our phone. The funny thing is every time Karen goes to get the mail every day, I get an alert that sees her <laughs> and our son goes out to jog and I see him out in the front yard and he's stretching. I'm going, this is interesting. They don't know I'm watching. But it's like there's cameras everywhere. And God has had cameras for a long time. There are angels that record everything we say. Jesus said in the judgment, you'll give an account for every idle word that you speak. Uh, God sees everything we do. Let me give you a few verses on that. Job 20, verse 27 the heavens will re reveal his iniquity, speaking of the lost, and the earth will rise up against him. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 14. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing. We think nobody knows. Everything we'll give an answer for. And you may have sinned and thought, well, I got away with that. Nobody will know. I don't need to say anything. You don't get away with anything. Uh, everything that's done in secret will be ultimately proclaimed from the housetops unless it is confessed, repented of, forsaken, and you want it under the blood of Jesus. In uh, Zechariah 4.10, these are the eyes of the Lord, which scan to and fro throughout the whole earth. You know, I'm, one reason I became a Christian is because I saw providentially you don't ever get away with anything. I was a thief, and I realized I, I never really got away with anything. And... Um, I just became convinced there must be a God because it seemed like you know, we started calling it karma. It seemed like something always went wrong when you tried to do the wrong thing. And um, you know what they say on the streets is what goes around comes around. It'll catch up with you. Nobody ever really gets away with anything. And so I'm, I'm sharing this sort of as a background why it is important to confess because uh, you'll never really get ahead by doing wrong or, or by disobeying God. In uh, Proverbs chapter 5, verse 21, For the ways of man are before the eyes of the Lord, and he ponders all of his paths. Um, confession is really, of sin, is the outward fruit of repentance. Now, when we talk about repentance and confession, they're really partners, but they're separate. So we need to identify it separately. Some people said, well, I'm sorry for my sins, but they've never confessed them to God. And we're suggesting to you that the Bible teaches it is important to specifically confess your sins. While you may not remember every sin, he wants us to confess what we know. 
Hebrews chapter 4, verse 13, Paul says, There is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him with whom we must give an account. I was counseling a couple years ago, and um, I heard an amazing story. And this is many years ago. And uh, the wife and the husband were there, and she told me that uh, there had been unfaithfulness in the relationship. And I said, well, do you know that? You know? And he said, yeah, she knows it. And she said, yes, I know it. Let me tell you what happened. Husband had been acting strangely for a couple of months, and he was doing a little extra traveling, it seemed like, more than his job would normally want. And he called me one night, and he said, you know, I have, I've got some extra work. I'm on this out-of-town business trip, and it looks like I'm going to be another day. And I'm you know, so sorry, and, and, and I'll be home soon. And she said, okay. She just felt something didn't sound right. And he went to hang up the phone, except it was one of these hotels that had a flat phone, and he didn't get it completely on the cradle. And she, instead of just hanging up, she stayed on the line for just a minute because she's thinking, yeah, it just doesn't seem right. And then she realized he hadn't hung up. And she heard another woman talking to him in the hotel room. And I won't go into detail, but uh, it became very clear to her that her husband was being unfaithful. And I thought, I wonder how people would behave if they knew that God is always recording. You know, we had a little church up in the hills and it had the strangest sound system. Uh, just had an inexpensive Radio Shack sound system and something about the length of the wires to the speakers. They weren't shielded. And whenever any airplane flew over or an ambulance went by, I've never run into it before, it seemed to pick up their frequencies and it would broadcast it in the church. So while you're in there in the church and you're preaching, all of a sudden you would hear the ambulance drivers talking on the radio. And sometimes what even ambulance drivers say to each other is not appropriate to broadcast in a church. And I wondered if they only knew that what they think they're saying just on the radio to the dispatch is being broadcast in the local church, how much more careful would they be? Well, everything is naked and open to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. There is a judgment day coming, and everybody is going to give an account for everything. And that's why it's so crucial for us to not wait until we kneel with the devil outside of the New Jerusalem. Everybody will ultimately bow before Christ and confess that Jesus is Lord. But to confess while the doors of mercy are still open, that would be now. You can't wait, friends. So with that little background, I'm going to go through my ritual of having five or six points we're going to cover about confession. And I'll start with why do we confess? Why would we confess? Uh, Jesus said, your heavenly Father, and this is Matthew chapter 6, verse 8, he knows what things you have need of before you even ask. So why tell him? Well, confession isn't for the benefit of God. You know, when I was a baby Christian and I heard about confession, I, you know, I just, in my mind, I had it like, all right, Lord, you better sit down. There's something I got to tell you. And then I realized, wait a second. God knows everything. I'm not going to fill in the Lord. So when you confess, it's not like you're saying, brace yourself, Lord. I've got some heavy things to share with you. He knows more about you than you know about you. So you're not confessing to fill him in. One very important thing that happens when you're confessing is you are recognizing in your own heart what you're doing is wrong. You're giving freedom then of the Holy Spirit to give you victory in that area because you're admitting it's wrong and you want change. The other thing is once you admit it's wrong, something happens within you mentally. Then you realize there's consequences and you're accountable. Once you acknowledge something is wrong, you're acknowledging that it is a sin and it's something that must be repented of, forsaken, and confessed. You know, it was amazing to me for years how the tobacco companies waffled and squirmed and went through all these legal gymnastics to do everything they could do to avoid saying tobacco is bad for your health. You know, there was actually a time years ago when doctors recommended smoking. But then the science began to come out that it was very bad. You know, over 100 years ago, they knew smoking um, caused long-term health problems and people were dying early from lung cancer. And, but the tobacco companies kept denying it. First, they said, oh, it's actually good for your health. And there are some studies. And, and then even after everybody universally understood that smoking was killing people, the, the tobacco companies were afraid if we ever come out and admit it, 
then we become liable. They finally did have to admit it. They're still selling tobacco, but they had to put money in a fund, billions of dollars, to pay for a lot of people that ended up with an addiction and cancer and emphysema and all these other problems connected with it. But it was amazing to me how they fought admitting the obvious. People don't like confessing. It can sometimes make them uncomfortable, but it's actually good for you because it's liberating. I, I want you to look for just a moment. If you go to Psalm chapter 32, and this is a psalm, we looked at David's psalm in uh, chapter 51, but there's another repentance psalm in chapter 32. And here David says, Blessed is he, verse 1, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed. Now, it's telling us about blessing when your sin is covered. How do you get to that point? Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity and in whose spirit there is no good deceit. When I kept silent, I didn't want to confess. When I kept silent, my bones grew old through my groaning all the day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. There's this guilt. This is oppression. This is darkness when we're still under the burden of our sins. But, verse 5, I acknowledge my sin to you. Finally, he stopped avoiding it. I acknowledge my sin to you and my iniquity I've not hidden. I said, I will confess my transgression to the Lord and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. For this cause, everyone who is godly will pray to you in a time when you might be found. And so David said, you know, as long as I was hiding it, I w there's an oppression, there's a darkness. So one reason you want to confess is to have that liberation. Look in Matthew 18. The Bible says, Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you've gained your brother. So when we're talking about confessing sin, obviously there's times you want to confess your sin to God, but sometimes there's times you want to confess your sin to someone else. If I do something to offend a brother or a sister and they know that I did it, they may know it and I might know it, but something changes in the relationship when I say, I am sorry, I regret that, will you forgive me? Then that paves the way for restoration. If that's true of our relationships with each other, how much more is that true of our relationship with God? So in order to bridge our relationship, we need to confess. And it's actually, it's refreshing. It, it gives you, it lifts your burdens when you do this. You can read in um, the wonderful promise, you read in uh, 1 John 1 verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So the Lord wants to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, but we must confess our sins. Now, what I said this morning and now about repentance and confession, uh, please make a special note. I want to underscore this. The height of your spiritual experience is going to be in exact proportion to the depth of your repentance and your confession. I believe that there are churches full around the world of people who have never experienced freedom in Christ. They've never experienced a new birth. They've never experienced what it means to be full of the Spirit because they've never humbled themselves and really repented and confessed. So many, and it's, I'm not blaming everybody. I'm not blaming the people, but so many folks have come to church where the pastor simply says, if you come forward and repeat this, you know, 20-second prayer, you are now saved. And they kind of give them a book and send them on their way. And the people may not understand what it really means to come to the Lord, to kneel at the cross, to repent of their sins, to confess their sins. Let me see if I can illustrate. If, you know, we're here right now in the Amazing Facts worship room, we've got a handful of people helping with the production, maintaining our distance, except those that are married. And, uh, if on my way out, I'm in a hurry after the program, and I step on someone's foot on the, my way out, I would say, excuse me, it's a minor offense. It just requires a minor apology. And they hopefully would say, that's okay. Unless you hit their bunion, they might say, that really hurt. And then you say, I'm very sorry. But if on my way out, I, I'm rushing and I'm being reckless and I knock them down and they hit their head against the wall and they break an arm, and I just say, excuse me, and I keep going. Well, wait a second, that's not appropriate. You really hurt them. The depth of your apology should be in proportion to the offense. Are you still with me? <laughs> Nod the camera. <laughs> so, what have we done to Jesus? 
Do we just come to the front of the church and we say, Lord, I'm sorry, and we walk out? I mean, here he lost his life, he bled, he suffered for all of our sins. We should be so grateful, it ought to move us. And we think, Lord, have mercy on me. I am so sorry. And there, there, it should be heartfelt. So the depth of your repentance and your confession and the thoroughness of your confession is going to affect how much room you make for the filling of the Spirit in your life. I believe there are millions of people out there who have been following Christ that have never taken these important steps of really repenting and confessing your sins. Now, um, we'll get to how you confess in just a moment. But uh, now we're going to talk about the what of confession. What do you confess? Confess means, is a definition, it means to disclose something that is damaging or inconvenient to oneself, to admit, to acknowledge. As someone said, confession is good for the soul, but it's bad for the reputation. Uh, when you're admitting a fault, usually people will have more respect for you when you do that. Um, and you, you may not remember everything you've done. The Bible says, Proverbs 28, verse 13, He that covers his sin will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them. And God not only wants our confession, but he wants us to forsake our sins. So if you go to your boss, let's suppose you've been stealing from your boss. And you say, you know, boss, uh, I've become a Christian, and uh, I've been convicted because I've been stealing, but I want you to know I'm going to do my best to cut down. Well, yes, you confessed, but you're probably going to get fired because he doesn't want you to cut down. He wants you to stop. And so confession is, with repentance, is a sorrow for sin and a turning away from it. Hosea chapter 1, I'm sorry, Hosea 14, verse 1 and 2. O Israel, return to the Lord your God, for you have stumbled because of your iniquity. Take words with you. Doesn't that sound like the prodigal son? I will go and say to my father, take words with you and return to the Lord and say to him, take away all iniquity, receive us gracio graciously, for we will offer the sacrifice of our lips. Yes, there is something to be done in our speaking to God or another person in confessing your faults to them. Now with God, if you confess and you repent, God will always forgive you. Uh, but what about other people? What if you confess uh, a fault to someone else and they don't forgive you? Keep coming. We're going to talk about that one tomorrow night, about how to receive and pass on forgiveness. So in the what of confession, um, you may not remember everything you've done wrong. I'd like to make a suggestion that get by yourself. If you want this revival to really make a difference, then do something tangible. Uh, here's a little prescription you might follow. If you've never done this, go off by yourself uh, might be harder if you're home sequestering right now. But find a room, find your closet of prayer, and get on your knees. Tell the Lord. You may not even feel anything, but do it because you know it's the right thing to do and watch what happens. Get on your knees. Say, Lord, I want to repent of my sins. I'm choosing to repent of my sins. Uh, I know I've sinned all through my life. I'm guilty of many things. You can't remember everything you've ever done wrong. But get a piece of paper. Don't let anyone get a hold of that piece of paper. Get a piece of paper and, and make a list and start with the Ten Commandments. Have you ever worshipped other gods? Have you taken God's name in vain? Uh, have you, well, I've never committed adultery, but have you thought impure thoughts? Spiritual adultery. I've never committed murder. Have you been angry with your brother without cause? Lying. The Bible says, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Have you ever been misleading? And go through the Ten Commandments. And then pray that prayer that David says, search me, Lord, try me. See if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. The Holy Spirit will bring things to your mind. There may be friends, family, could be a spouse, a loved one that you are at odds with and you need to right those wrongs. Make a note of that. Confess it first to God. Then go to that person next. After you make that list, and don't r rush through it. Look at it and say, Lord, if I'm forgetting something, show me later. And he will. Then claim the promise. First John uh, chapter 2, he says in verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I said 1 John 1 verse 9. And he makes a promise. He'll cleanse you from how much? All unrighteousness. Now if he's cleansed you from all unrighteousness, when you get off your knees, is God going to keep his promise? 
Don't say, oh, but Lord, I don't know how well I'm going to live as a Christian today. At that moment, he gives you eternal life. That will then affect your behavior. You start becoming righteous by faith when you believe his promise. He then can give you the spirit and you'll be surprised moment by moment how you start living a different kind of life. So try going through those steps. God will bring things to your mind. Romans 10.10 10. For with a heart one believes unto righteousness and with a mouth confession is made unto salvation. Uh, do not expect God to cover what you do not uncover before him. He already knows everything. But lay it out before him. You know, I remember even years after I became a Christian, something came to me. Um, I was in Miami Beach where I used to go to school. I used to work. And um, I just went for a visit to the family. And while I was in Miami Beach, I remembered I had worked for a Baskin Robbins ice cream store. I got to work there and they told me, you can eat all the ice cream you want. And it was a dream job for me because I did. They said, you'll get tired of it. I never did. I ate a lot of ice cream while I was there. And he trusted me. I was just 14, 15 years old, but I was a good worker. I'd been in a military school. I kept everything clean and organized. And, and uh, eventually he gave me the keys and he had me, Mr. Scott was his name. He had me open the place and close the place and do the accounting and put the money in the freezer. And when I got ready to run away from home when I was like 15 years old, I had made myself an extra key and I went into the Baskin Robbins late at night and I went into the freezer. I knew where the key freezer was and I stole just enough cash where he wouldn't ever know it was missing. Years later, that came to me. And I thought, you know, I need to make that right. And so I went back to that Baskin Robbins, which I think it's still there today after all those years on Lincoln Mall. And I went back in, I went in, and I started asking for Mr. Scott and they said, oh, he sold the place years ago. And you know, I just felt this tremendous burden come off my shoulders by going in there. I wasn't worried about the 15 or $20. I just wanted to make things right with the Lord. And God, the big struggle for me was going and telling him because he trusted me. I said, well, do you know how I can contact him? They said, no, we, we have no way to contact him. And God just took the burden off me because he wanted to know, are you willing? And once I got to the place where I was willing, you know, I just felt real peace. And so he may reveal things to you. Now, Someone might be thinking, well, I robbed a bank. What do I do? Am I, if I confess, I might go to jail. I've had a lot of people that have come to me and they said, if I tell my boss what I've been doing, he's going to fire me. I said, trust the Lord. And I'm sure there's exceptions, but almost every time I know of when an, uh, a, a member or somebody comes to me and says, I'm convicted, I need to go talk to my boss, I've been cheating or doing something dishonest. I said, you go to them. If you tell them before you're caught, they'll know that there's a change in your heart. And you'd be surprised. They'll forgive you. So we, we've got the, uh, what is the confession? Search me, O God, and know me. Try me, know my thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. And it says in Job 13, 23, how many are my iniquities and my sins? Make me know my transgression and my sin. I dare you to pray that prayer. Say, Lord, show me. And he will. <coughs> then uh, what about the when of confession? When's the right time to confess? You know, one of the most beautiful prayers in the Bible is in Daniel chapter 9, where Daniel is reading the Bible. And in reading the Bible, he reads the prophecy of Jeremiah, and he knows that God wants to bring his people back, and Daniel becomes convicted that he has not been praying for his people. And the Bible tells us, if you read in Daniel chapter 9, verse 9, uh, uh, verse 3 through 6, then I set my face towards the Lord and made my request by prayer and supplications with fasting, sackcloth, ashes, and I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession. Notice what happens. He's reading the word, then he feels impressed to confess. And while he's praying and confessing, Daniel 9 verse 20, while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord, my God of the holy mountain of my God. Yes, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, reached, about, reached me about the time of the evening offering. So while he's praying, God sends an angel. When does Daniel confess? As soon as he is impressed about his sin. Go back to Psalm 32. I want you to notice something about the best time to confess. I acknowledge my sin to you, and my iniquity have not hidden, I said, I will confess my transgression to the Lord and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. 
For this cause, everyone who is godly shall pray to you in a time when you may be found. Call on him, Isaiah says, chapter 55, verse 6. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let them return to the Lord and he will have mercy upon them to our God and he will abundantly pardon. So you don't want to wait too long. Call upon him while he's near and he hears your prayer. During this series, we're hoping that you go through these steps of salvation and repent of your sins and confess and come to the Lord. Who do you confess to? Well, James 5.16, it says, Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you might be healed. Now, when it says confess your sins to one another, you know, I've, I've got some friends from the uh, Catholic Church and they insist this is the verse that shows you're supposed to confess your sins to a priest. I don't believe that's what the, the Lord is teaching here. Um, just read something from John Wycliffe here. It says, It is not the confession to man but to God who is the true priest of souls that is the great need of sinful man. Private confession and the whole system of medieval confession was not ordered by Christ and was not used by the apostles. For the, three, for the 3,000 who were turned to Christ on the day of Pentecost, not one of them was confessing to a priest. It is to God who is the forgiver that we confess. And so when it says confess your faults to each other, that's different than confessing your sins. If I've offended somebody, I'll confess that sin. If you have a close friend you can trust, it's good to have accountability with people. If people are struggling with different things, it's good to have a friend who knows how to, Proverbs says, conceal a matter, meaning keep a confidential trust that they can pray with you about something you're struggling with. But you want to be really careful about confessing private things to people because, well, you know, sometimes they say if two people know a secret, uh, it's not a secret anymore. And so uh, the sin against God should be confessed to God. Public sin should be confessed publicly. Private sin should be confessed privately. You probably heard the story about the uh, three pastors. They decided they needed to take a little vacation together, and so they all went out fishing. They're all off in the middle of the lake, and they're fishing, and things are going fine. And one of the pastors breaks down. He starts to cry. And it's kind of awkward for the other two. They hadn't done anything. They don't know what's come over him. And he said, you know, we're all alone out here. I feel like I can finally confide in somebody. He says, I've got a really big problem. He said, I'm, I'm cheating on my wife. And the other two looked at him and said, well, brother, you've got to make that right, but let's pray with you. And while they're praying, another pastor starts crying. And uh, they said, what's the problem? He said, well, my brother here inspired me. I need to open up and let you guys know that I've got a problem. I'm a kleptomaniac. I steal all the time. Little things. Don't need to. I just can't help myself. And they said, well, we'll pray for you. So they're praying. And then the two of them look at the other guy who had been strangely quiet. They said, anything you want to share? He says, well, yeah, but I can't. It's too awful. They said, well, what could be worse than what we describe? You can trust us. He said, well, my sin is gossip, and I can't wait to get back home and tell everybody. So you want to be really careful about confessing your sins to people. Uh, you want the private sin to be confessed to God. Um, now, ultimately, when we sin... Uh, God is the one we offend. I always thought it was interesting that when Potiphar's wife tempted Joseph, Joseph said, how can I do this terrible thing and sin against God? You and I would think, well, that would be a sin against Potiphar. In Psalm 51, David kills Uriah and he takes Bathsheba and he says, against you only I have sinned. And in Genesis 39, I'm sorry, in uh, Job chapter 28, he says, uh, when men say I have sinned and perverted what is right and it did not profit me, he will redeem his soul from going down to the pit and his life shall see the light. So ultimately, when we sin, we are breaking the commandments of God. And they should, those sins should be confessed to God. Um, there may be a time for public confession. And I'll get to that in just a second. Uh, very few sins she should be confessed publicly. I want to read something from the book Steps to Christ, page 38. Confession of sin whether public or private, should be heartfelt and freely expressed. It's not to be urged from the sinner. The confession that is the outpouring of the inmost soul finds its way to the God of infinite pity. True confession is always of a specific character, and it acknowledges particular sins. 
They may be of such a nature as to be brought before only God, but they are wrongs that should be confessed then to individuals who have suffered injury through them. Or they may be of a public character and then they should be confessed publicly. But all confession should be definite and to the point acknowledging the very sins of which you're guilty. Uh, sometimes people are very general in their confession and God is saying you ought to be a little more specific. Jesus said to the woman at the well, go call your husband. He put his finger on, he identified something specific in her life that was out of order. And um, I think it's appropriate for us to be specific when we're confessing our sins. Um, and you need to come clean with God. Don't hold anything back. And if you draw near to him and open your heart, he will then fill your heart with his spirit. This man was walking one day uh, through the town village years ago, and he saw that there was this one man that was in the stocks. He was, you know, they had the, his hands and his neck were in those old English stocks where he was being confined for some crime. And he felt sorry for him. He said, what did you do? He said, I didn't do anything. I don't understand why they put me in these stocks. And they said, you didn't do anything? He said, well, there was, a, there was an old rope on the ground. It just was an old, twiny old rope. And he said, I picked it up. I had no idea. They said, they put you in the stocks for just picking up the rope? He said, well, there was a little cow attached to the other end of the rope. You know, sometimes we're real reluctant to call sin, sin. And we tell the Lord, well, I made a mistake. Uh, I've got this little defect but be open with God. Acknowledge it. So the more thorough and specific you are, the more you give God permission to activate the power of the Holy Spirit in your life in setting you free. So um, the wear of confession, public sins should be publicly confessed. Sometimes there's something that's very obvious and you may want to actually share it publicly if you're in a public position when you commit those sins. Peter publicly denied the Lord with swearing and cursing. And, uh, you know, after the resurrection, then J Jesus asked him to identify that. And three times he said, Simon Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? When you do confession, you want to do the whole confession. Isaiah 6, verse 5, Isaiah was being specific. He said, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the king. You notice what happened is when Isaiah said, I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, the angel then takes a coal from the altar, and where does he put it? Puts it on his lips. God, when you identify what the specific problems are, you are then giving God permission and power to help you in those specific areas. And so confess. Now, we've had frequent questions that come in. And by the way, we encourage you to continue sending in your questions uh, reg regarding these different revival subjects. And people are saying, well, how often? Doesn't God get tired of hearing me confess to him over and over about the same thing? I think that you will get tired of confessing a lot sooner than God gets tired of hearing. If you ever come to the Lord and you are sincere and sorry about your sin, then uh, he is sincerely willing to forgive you. Peter asked the Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Seven times? And Jesus said, 70 times seven. And Jesus said, if your brother comes to you seven times in one day and says, I repent, forgive him. Now, is God asking us to do less for each other than he's willing to do for us? Don't get discouraged, friends, and think that, uh, that God is not willing to forgive you. The reason Jesus came into the world is to seek and to save the lost. He is very earnest about wanting to forgive us. That's his supreme desire. That was the mission of Jesus in the world is to come and to save us. So there is a risk that some will wait and confess too late. Uh, you know, Judas confessed. He says, I betrayed innocent blood. But at that point, he had grieved away the Holy Spirit. And the Pharaoh, uh, he confessed and he repented but he waited until he had grieved away the Holy Spirit. Um, and there's a danger that you can wait too long. The, it's so important that when you hear God call, today is the day of salvation. The Bible says now is the appointed time. Today if you hear his voice. When Jesus calls people, whenever he called the apostles, he said, follow me. They dropped what they were doing and they followed him. And if you're hearing the Holy Spirit speak to you about something now, Listen to the Spirit. God is not wanting to take away your joy. He's wanting to give you joy and peace. 
He says, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. But before God can lift you up, the Bible says we must humble ourselves before the Lord and then he will lift us up. Now, years ago, I heard about a, uh, a coal mine accident. It was in Kentucky somewhere. And this is a long time ago. And these men were trapped. The regular shaft that took them up the elevator and out of the mine was completely imploded and they thought it was hopeless. Uh, gradually, they saw that their lights were growing dim, which made them worry that they were running out of oxygen. But there was one old miner there. And he said, you know, I think there's hope. Uh, they were in the dark, but he felt a light breeze. And he said, we had an old ventilation shaft that went from this chamber to another chamber, but you've got to crawl for almost a quarter of a mile. It's going to be dark. You're going to have to just be on your belly. You can't take any gear with you. He said, follow me, and I think we've got a way out. Well, they had to get down and crawl for a while, and eventually the shaft, the uh, air duct shaft was open, and they were all able to escape but they all had to unload and they had to get down and they had to crawl. You know, there's a way to freedom, there's a way to the light, but we have to humble ourselves before the Lord. If we will humble ourselves and pray, the Bible tells us, he will then hear our prayers. It's sometimes hard for people to say they're sorry. And you know, even in the closest relationship, sometimes I find it's harder for couples to apologize to each other than it is for a person to apologize to his his uh, work associates or, or somebody in public. Um, you have to admit your humanity, admit your weakness, and that requires that we humble ourselves. But Jesus says, if we will humble ourselves, he will then lift us up. It's the beginning to restore our relationships to confess this way. And you know, one more thing I'll share. When we're talking about confession during this week when we're praying together, don't just be thinking about confessing your sins. In the Bible, it says, if we confess our sins, in the Lord's Prayer, it says, forgive us. We should remember corporate prayer. Daniel, chapter 9, it says, when Daniel was confessing his sin and the sin of his people. And Isaiah said, Lord, I'm a sinful man, and I dwell in the midst of a sinful people. Um, Nehemiah, he was confessing his sin and the sin of the people. Ezra, chapter 10, confessing his sin in the sin of the people. Leviticus, um, 1 Samuel chapter 12, all through the Bible, they realize, you know, we're in this thing together. And I wonder what will happen if God's people around the country, you know, we heard last night we've got over 100,000 people within 24 hours of these broadcasts is participating in the program. And I hope you'll continue to share with your friends what's happening during this revival. What would happen if you get 100,000 people and some of these are families with several people in the home, so we don't know how many it is. All around the world, if we would pray and confess our sins to God and humble ourselves and confess the sins of the church, humble ourselves as a people, that we're all in this thing together. I not only am interested in my being saved, I should be interested in your being saved and your forgiveness. What will God do at a time like that? So Jesus is saying to you and me, just like he said to Peter, do you love me? Peter said, Lord, you know I love you. Do you love me? You know I love you. Do you love me? You know I love you. Three times Peter denied Jesus. Three times Jesus asked him to publicly confess his love for the Lord. Don't be afraid of this, friends. The Lord is wanting to restore our relationship. I want to remind you, if you joined us a little late before we have our closing prayer, we do have a book I think will bless you. It's free download. If you like a copy of this, it's called is it easier to be saved or lost? All you have to do is text the word confession, and here's the number, 40544. Text this. You can download it, read it now. You can forward the, the book to someone else, and we'd like to cause a revival in, in the process. Let me close by having prayer with you, and let's all pray together for God's Spirit. Father in heaven, we thank you for what you're doing right now, and we pray for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Be with these people who are gathered in their homes around the country and the world. And I pray that we can be transformed, Lord, through this revival and that you'll move your spirit and send the latter rain. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.